This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. If anything, my appreciation for cooking has grown. Um, I'm really loving the fact that I love it so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Over the summer, we're going to catch up with past guests and share stories from their lives in food. Today, I'm with Jared Ingersoll. Jared, how are you, mate? I'm really good, Anthony. Fantastic to hear from you. It feels like a long, long time ago, you were episode three of Deep in the Weeds. The world has changed a little bit since then, but we're, everything's a little bit more optimistic. How are you feeling? Um, yeah, look, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, it's nice having things sort of feel like they're moving back to normal or at least normal shifting to a place where everybody can enjoy themselves again and get out a bit and and um but yeah like it's i'm actually feeling feeling pretty good well this time of year everyone does feel pretty good and christmas the christmas new year's summer uh, do you have any stories of um food and summer from when you were young oh yeah because um i mean heaps and it's one of those things that like I, the, when I think back I was telling my kids about this the other day I still remember my first watermelon and my first mango on summer days and like mangoes in New Zealand were not that common and like I just, I just wanted to stick my face into a watermelon and I was what have been about eight or nine and just literally just freaking out like it was one of those moments where I was just like holy f- what what is what is this thing and then just trying to force as much of it in my mouth as possible um and then you know, when, when we got together for family you know it was always especially around christmas time there was you know there was you tick all the boxes you know, there had to be a ham um there had to be family members drunk um and you know but the the big one is always the fried eggs and ham the following morning after a christmas that's um that's that's a that's a must do, but like you know, I mean, food and good times and and um, seasons are pretty much the only things that make me happy, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a, an amazing connection with with produce and and with with nature. You like to get out there and and hike and adventure and ski and all sorts of stuff. Do you have any stories of of camping and and those sort of experiences of getting out in the wild? Um, yeah, stacks. I mean, some of the best things in the world to do is to go out in the bush and, and light a fire and cook something over it. Um, untold. Like um, I was reminded earlier about like you know just having a really good barbecue cook up at a mate's wedding and then you know driving over the fish. That was really funny. Do you remember that one, Huxley? <laughs> uh, I, I can't remember whose wedding it was, but I, it sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah, it sounds very familiar. <laughs> um, but, and and um, I also um, do a bit of backcountry skiing and stuff as well. So that sort of yeah, the food you take out in those type of environments is a little bit different from if you're doing a car camp. Like you know, so you know if you're carrying everything, it's got to be super light. But um, one of the things that I love over winter is just taking out like a little fondue and cooking it in a, in a camp stove. Um, oh man, there's, there's heaps. There's so many different things. And, and in fact, actually, because, you know, we're coming into the festive season, like the last few years I haven't been indoors over Christmas um, or New Year's Eve. So, you know, just yeah, doing things like, you know, cooking big pots of bacon and potatoes and, um, you know, mm. roasting sausages, just, yeah, all that sort of cool campfire type stuff. What is it about sort of those adventures that you have out out in nature? What what is it that you love about it so much? It, there's a 
it allows me to just, uh, actually how do I put this without sounding too weird I can't function in a city <laughs> <laughs> I actually start to get a little bit tweaked if I spend too much time in a city um, it's just like it's just something that I have realized that I need to do in order to just keep my shit together um, and there's uh, there's a Japanese um, phrase which is like uh, yeah which basically which is beautiful it's um, forest bathing and it just sort of that thing that you get when you go out into nature and you sort of just wash off all the all the crap and the muck from modern busy day lives but the other thing that I find really beautiful and empowering about it is it's just remind you what's important like you know COVID and all these other things that have happened they were supposed you know they, they allowed everybody to have a good hard look at what their realities are and what sort of world they want around them but when you go out for a couple of days hiking or you put yourself in a really sort of um, in in an environment where you're immersed in nature you know it's like there's a bunch of shit you don't have to worry about it's like, you know, and there's a lot of stuff that just, like, you know, Christ, I look at my kids sometimes, they get stuck on Instagram and stuff, and it's just like, man, chuck that shit away and just go sit in the bush for a couple of days, and then you come back and you realise that you actually don't need to spend, you can still engage with these things, but they can't, they, it's, yeah, like, it's a nice short circuit from the world around you. Circuit breaker, wait, circuit breaker, that's the word I was looking for. You grew up in uh, in New Zealand and barbecues are popular in Australia and New Zealand, but the, the hangi is uh, really special to New Zealand. Did you have experiences of that as a kid? Oh, yeah. That, um, I was actually going to touch on that before, but um, hangis are awesome. And what I think that um, a lot of people don't realise is it's not just a case of just digging a hole, chucking stuff in and burying it up. The best hangies that I've been to, like, you know, you start building a fire the day before and you're heating up the rocks and and um, and it takes a really long time. So there's always crates of beer and everybody's, you know, playing guitars, singing songs. So it's it's not like you just turn up and then switch on the gaslit barbie and then you're eating an hour later. There's like, you know, a few days of preparation and planning into it. And then by the time you finally crack the earth and you bring the the food out and you sit down and eat it. It's kind of like that coming together of the food is kind of just that one little moment is just the result of a couple of days of planning and socializing and, and, um, and connecting. And um, yeah, it's a pretty special thing. And, and I know people have got, there are these contraptions out there about, you know, how you can make hungry faster and, you know, gas-fired hungies and stuff. And it's like, for me, it kind of misses the point. It's not just about eating something that was cooked a particular way. It was about embracing the time that it took to prepare that meal. You've done all sorts of amazing things in your career, but one of the real trademarks of what you did was that your ability to cook for a lot of people and particularly over fire and in outdoor areas and stuff like that. A lot of people are cooking for a lot of people at this time of year. What's the advice for you, from you about making that a real success? Um, <clears throat> logistics. Like whenever you're doing anything for big numbers, um, logistics are everything. Um, so there's timing and all that sort of stuff. Um, and when you're doing like a, you know, like I've done a, a few like, like a big outdoor events, like I did Dartmoor for one year. So, you, you know, things like, you know, how much wood are you going to use when you, you're basically, you know, cooking over fire for thousands of people for three days. Um, it's, but what I generally find is that when people are cooking at home um, and or for smaller numbers, there's kind of like this thing, you get to a certain number of people that are coming to your house and you start freaking out disproportionately. So it's like, you know, you can cook for yourself, that's fine. I'm cooking for 10 people. It's like, well, for some reason, I'm just going to freak out heaps because, well, you know, when when it comes to cooking over fire, like doing a, a chalk or a piece of fish, um, it's actually a lot simpler than what people think. It's intimidating to think about. But it's not rocket surgery. Like, you're basically putting something over fire until it's cooked. The trick is just understanding the inter interplay between the heat and the thing you're cooking. 
And so even if you've never done it before, you know what too hot feels like with your hand. Um, and so, you know, where the meat goes over the flame is actually quite important. I think where people get un um, get stuck is that they'll, uh, you know, they'll, it, there's the thing where the flame needs to be licking away at the meat. It's actually not the way, the best way to cook was it sort of gets all smoky and gross. So it's a, um, yeah, so, I mean, the best piece of advice is that if you're going to cook for a large number of people and you're going to do it over an open fire, um, be – just don't freak out. Just do it. <laughs> don't overthink it. <laughs> I know it sounds – but, like, just – if you fear the process, it will stuff up. Food can smell your fear. If you just approach it in a nice, relaxed way, then you'll have fun. At, at the heart of your cooking was always quality for produce first and then sort of try to do as little to it as possible. What, what food or produce yells summer to you? Oh, man. It's, <laughs> I mean, tomatoes. Tomatoes, stone fruits. Um, people go nuts for oysters for some reason over Christmas, and I find that quite often I, I prefer them in the cool, cooler months and the nicer to eat. Um, so, um, you know, ham, just because I was brought up with it and there is absolutely no reason why we have to eat salted pork on Christmas day, other than mum told me to, so I still do it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we've got a, a heaps of seafood, um, at our fingertips. So seafood's always something that sort of, for some reason, just pops up a lot more in the, in the, um, in the summer months. You've got, you, you've got a, you've got a couple of kids. What, what are you planning on cooking uh, this summer? Uh, the the boys, <clears throat> um, I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. They eat pretty well. Um, they're not. <laughs> they, they, I, I quite often cook for my own pleasure rather than what their preferences are, and and so I really. That's one of the things since I don't cook professionally as much anymore. I spend a lot more time really enjoying the process in the in my home kitchen. You, you just mentioned you're not in the kitchen uh, like you used to be. Has your cooking changed and, and your sort of interests and um, the ingredients that you use now that it's more for, for love rather than the career? It's No, it's really cool. Um, it's something that, if anything, my appreciation for cooking has grown. Um I'm really loving the fact that I love it so much. Um, and and it's also when you remove the logistic concerns about food cost and and you know whether or not whether or not staff are gonna turn up and all that sort of bollocks, the actual process of cooking, I'm I am i am deeply fascinated and I love it. And the types of flavours and food that I cook are not that different from what I used to cook in, in the kitchen. They're just in different quantities. Um, I still do things like, you know, you know, I don't throw anything out. So I just const there's usually some form of a leftover that reappears in the next meal. Um, and it could be like, a, you know, if I made a little bit too much dressing, I'll just change the flavor profile to, or it might turn into a marinade or, um, I still sort of, I've still got random jars of weird pickles and stuff that, you know, some of them, I don't, can't remember what's in them. Um, but you know, they will end up being in, in a, in a meal. Um, I don't have, I think one of the things I really noticed is you don't have the same ease of access to really high quality produce um, out there, out here as a punter. Um, I was really spoilt with picking up the phone and getting, you know, the best of anything delivered to me. And um, so that, that kind of sucks being a normal person. You've got a, a role with Canva at the moment. You've been he heading the sort of sustainability drive and they've got a huge food program and stuff as well. What, what, what have you been doing and what sort of impact has it had? That's been, um, yeah, like it's re really quite fascinating. And this is probably yeah, a long conversation, but the easiest thing, and actually probably the most successful thing that we've really focused on is just changing the relationships that we have with our supply chain. And so we're now, so Mark Hanover is the head chef there. Um, 
it's the, he's really, really drilled down on, on, on those relationships. And the way that that's manifesting is that you know, we, there's a farm that we buy 80% of our produce from. And you know, working on a financial model that allows them to uh, you know, exist, which is good, but also scale and grow and not just be reliant on one customer like Canva. Um, we've, um, we're looking at the way we're purchasing our proteins. So we're now starting to use a similar type of arrangement where we're actually paying for animals and we're making commitments in advance. And so like, yeah, and, and what that means is then um, rather than the normal model of a, a farmer rearing a head of beef, hoping he can sell the different bits, we actually went, okay, well, we want a bunch of cows, ducks, chickens, pigs, um, Canva is not interested in the eye fillets or the or the you know the high volume high price cuts, so we pay in advance for all the cheaper stuff. So then that farmer has now got a um, that grower has now got um, it, that whole relationship with us has been de-risked, um, and it hasn't cost us any more. It's it's actually worked out to be quite quite a good way of purchasing. Um, we're also working with um, native grains and native ingredients, and and um, so there's all these direct procurement strategies that we're working on um, that we employ and embrace. Um, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that um, nothing is wasted as well. So we've got relationships with Oz Harvest. Um, we support charities with any excess supply. Um, you know, we compost everything. We've got bees. Uh, what else is there? But in addition to what's just happening in the office, um, we're really focusing on um, projects that have a carbon story to it and and food and agroforestry. So we're looking at some really, really op- um, fascinating opportunities there. So it's um yeah, so it's a, it's it's a it's a funny thing going from a chef to now heading sustainability for a tech company, but it's it's kind of, you know, when you unpack it all, it says basically, you know, understand your relationships, care about what you're buying, don't be excessive, don't waste anything, and, um, yeah, be nice to each other. Now that we're in 2022, what are you looking forward to in the next year? Uh, I want to see more of the people that mean a lot to me. And it's really sort of, I've got, you know, beautiful friends that you sort of get sidetracked with life and you sort of you, know, you forget about the quality of the relationship and so um, that's something I, I'm really looking forward to in 2022 that and also trying to figure out how to not have gravity affect my body in the same way as it has in the last couple of years <laughs> it's been a little bit depressing <laughs> So, fuck it. so, you know, I want, I want to try and figure out the Benjamin Button routine. I don't know. Well, uh, that that wedding that you spoke of where you cooked uh, with with three other amazing chefs and you um, accidentally drove over a whole fish, um, that may or may not have been my wedding, I can't say. But, um, Jared, it's um, amazing to catch up with you and very much looking forward to seeing you again. We've loved having you on the summer edition of Deep in the Weeds. Keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Beautiful. Thanks, Anthony. And catch you later. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.